My friends, the Ukrainians have conducted several successful counteroffensive in Bahmut area. Right here we see the military map Bahmut 12th of May and we fast forward, we see how the map changes and this map doesn't even have the newest updates. This here is Klishivka. There was a Russian salient right here that faced surroundment when Ukrainians would have taken these fields here. Now the Russians have actually pulled out. Russian troops have pulled back from this direction into Klishivka. Ukrainians are pushing from both sides, from north and from south to Klishivka. Noel report summarizes these events here perfectly. These fields have been abandoned by the Russian troops. Fighting is happening across this channel right here. This is a waterway, small stream and as you can see it's partly the front line right now. From the north Ukrainians have crossed it probably by now. But in this area west from Klishivka Ukrainians have not yet crossed it. If they cross it they will probably strike over these fields into Klishivka. Russian designed units or paratrooper units or you know semi-special forces units however you call them have been pulled to fortify these flanks and fortify the settlement of Klishivka. Now let's go north of Bahmut 12th of May and we skip forward we see again Russians pulling out and Ukrainians liberating the land. The main axis here is Dobova Vasilivka. The first settlement to be liberated in this area probably will be this one. These white ones of course are fields but these small strips of forest right here these are the key positions because these forests have been bombarded to the ground there are only three stumps left as you have seen from the photos they truly remind of Verdun first world war but underneath these three stumps are Russian dugouts trench lines and these are fortified positions that the Ukrainians will strike with tanks and infantry fighting vehicles drive straight onto these three stumps and onto these dugouts the Ukrainians will dismount the tanks will pull back and the infantry clears out these dugouts in the recent days a lot of drone videos about it have been released. These dark areas are where it's at. Everything happens around these dark wooden areas. When Ukrainians strike straight into these wooden areas, there have been videos of Russian street retreating straight over the fields. And then the Ukrainian troops who have dismounted and taken these Russian dugouts are picking them off one by one while they're running over these fields. The unfortunate news is that Wagnerite forces inside Bahmut have actually advanced. And the advancement is not minor, it's actually one of the major ones in the last months. 13th of May, and as you can see, Levenevskova Street right here, they have pushed on this street, taken a few buildings next to it, both sides. But it is no use, because if you take the city and your flanks are weak, the city will be surrounded by the Ukrainians. This is the everlasting conflict between Brigozhin, Wagner and the Russian armed forces, because the sides, the flanks, are defended by the regular Russian army and Wagner is inside Bakhmut. So if the flanks will crumble, Wagner will crumble. That's how it is. But now let's go back to the south again. Klishivka, this settlement, a very big priority for Ukraine. There was a local Russian army headquarters here yesterday, but somebody, some colonel or general who was in that headquarters yesterday, decided to smoke extremely carelessly. I don't know what's up with that. They probably throw their cigarette butts everywhere because kaboom, it was blown to smithereens blown to space and over a very long period of time we again hear of two Russian colonels knocked out cold. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense the names of the knocked out cold colonels are Colonel Vyacheslav Makarov and Colonel Yevgeny Provka. These were the highest ranking officers that were demilitarized but there were a lot of lower ranking officers because there was a meeting at the time. Of course there was a meeting because Russian colonels and officers smoke during the meeting and they tend to smoke carelessly. A huge blow to the Russians in the area. The leadership of this area has been decapitated for some time. They have to send in new officers now. And the defense and the flanks are already crumbling. Now we will watch a video of Roman Hryshenko, commander of the 127th Territorial Defense Brigade, who is fighting near Bahmut. Let's see what he has to say about the situation. Slava Ukraini. Сьогодні 13 травня 2023 року я Гриші Карман, командир 127 бригади сил територіального України. Сьогодні трішки довше надам доповідь, але з якої причини поясню. Я розумію, що ви всі втомилися від фрази, коли я констатую факт, що обстановка у Бахмуті важка, але контрольована. 
where the Ukrainians control about 10% of the city and Wagner advanced also breaking the current status quo in the city and the defense line. The more Wagner rights push inside the city, the better for the Ukrainians because that's the only area where Russians are actively attacking, meaning where they're actively, actively losing their fighting force, decreasing their ability to attack in the future. If they won't attack anymore, that is bad for Ukraine because then Ukraine would have to start decreasing the Russian offensive capabilities. Right now, the Russians are doing it for, for the Ukrainians. Hello. Якби я міг сказати вам більше, повірте, ви б це знали. Відразу розставлю акцент на тому, що підрахунок будівель, скільки ще залишилось будівель в Бахмуті, скільки залишилось відсотків там території. Головне, головне, що ми тут, головне, що сили оборони тримають свої позиції. Це головне. Я скажу вам так, навіть якщо не залишиться будівель, this goes straight against the Russian doctrine in Bahmut to bombard every building to the ground and then advance. Much like they did in Grozny during the Second War of Chechnya, they bombarded city methodically bit by bit to the ground and then advanced so the defenders didn't have a place to defend anymore. Well, right here this defender says that it doesn't matter. You may use the tactics of Grozny. You may bombard the buildings to the ground, we will defend the streets then. The Russian tactic has proved to be very costly and not work. Understand? <laughs> On this I have to not agree with this commander because everything I analyze, every info I get, a lot of this information is put out by the Ukrainian commanders, which is part of the Ukrainian information war. So if I multiply this information to bring it to the bigger audiences, then the Russians will see it. And it's probably the information Ukrainians want Russians to see. It's part of their information war, leading the Russian side to the wrong conclusions, perhaps even leading the West to the wrong conclusions. Ukraine is playing a very, very genius information warfare chess. And I'm a part of it as a pawn. So I think I'm doing my job if I multiply the information I get from the Ukrainian commanders because I'm pretty sure it is thought through and if the Russians see it, they're meant to see it. I know that this is interesting, but I will ask you from my brothers. You don't need to. There is something to thank us here. There are our thoughts. We know what we need to do. We know what we need to do. But... Uh, 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 Не давайте можливості ворогу зметикувати і розпізнати наші задуми на наступні дії. Це дуже важливе питання. Не треба робити ніяких припущень чи аналізів. Не треба дуже багато говорити про тему можливих контрнаступів. I again don't agree because all of the talk during the last six months, during the last maybe four months actually, about the counteroffensive, every Western military blogger and Russian military blogger talking about it has created this huge bubble of fear in the Russian mind. This bubble of fear is the only thing that makes them panic and makes them abandon their positions at the first sight of the Ukrainian tank. It's not the counteroffensive, it's just one tank advancing and they're running already because in their mind they project this bubble of fear of the counteroffensive and this is because we have all talked about it. Me, other military bloggers, the Russians. So I don't agree on this one. I think talking about it creates the, the necessary conditions for the Russians to abandon their positions. Uh, Є генеральний штаб, який каже, сьогодні звільнено то, то і то, там тримається оборона. Все, більше не треба нікого. Я вас прошу. Повірте мені, ми робимо все можливе і все неможливе ми теж робимо. Хочу подякувати за порозуміння всім українцям. Дякую вам. Ще раз кажу, я розумію, що ви так само, як і я, чекаєте нашу спільну перемогу. Отож, бажаю їй найшвидшого наближення. Дуже вдячний нашим хлопцям та дівчинам, які виконують свої завдання. Дуже вдячний підрозділам, які нам в цьому допомагають разом з нами, їх виконують. Обіцяв, маю зробити ССО. Знаєте за що. Дякую вам.
Саме тому, ще раз констатую, Бахмут стоїть. Ми виконуємо свої обов'язки, виконуємо накази. Як би важко не було, повірте мені, ми все зробимо. Слава Україні! Thank you for this update, Roman Hryshenko. Do you feel that? The crown is trembling. The clown is coming again. We're gonna watch a video about Prigozhin and he has gone very crazy in the recent days. I've not reported on everything. Something big has come up about him. He doesn't have a way back to Russia. I don't think he does. There are rumors. Actually, there are documents which state that Prigozhin has talked to the uh, secret service of Ukraine to make a deal for Prigozhin to capture Bakhmut, what the Ukrainians could give to him. It is all part of the bigger power play in Russia that Prigozhin would be the one to capture Bakhmut, but he needs the Ukrainian help to do so because he couldn't do it without them. Ukrainians, of course, refused. But there are documents stating that Prigozhin tried to negotiate with the Ukrainians many times for he, him to be able to capture Bakhmut. Now, if this information is public in Russia, he is done in Russia. But in this video, it gets even juicier. I'll stop you right here. This is a plain lie. Prisoners they were sending to the front, they were not trained at all. They were just sent as meat and the... Uh, They were used to pin out the Ukrainian artillery positions who were firing upon the prisoners. So this is just... Uh... Okay, let's go on. I've seen those monsters and heavily trained troops of Wagnerites through the Ukrainian frontline cameras. Um, they're not monsters. Okay, there is a very big change in Prigozhin's talk recently when he has gone against the Russian Minister of Defense and recently even against Putin. Now he's speaking like, like he is appealing to the people. We all know what a monster Prigozhin is. He doesn't care about the human life. But now suddenly he really emphasizes the fact that he cares and the Russian Minister of Defense doesn't because they send men to die. I think he's playing to get the Russian populace on his side. This is an information war within Russia, power struggle. Prigozhin is appealing to the regular Russian who has lost somebody in this war and looking, to, looking for somebody to blame. He will be on Prigozhin's side, blaming the Ministry of Defense. This is the beginning of the grand power struggle war in Russia that is, that is going to happen. <laughs> So he's talking about the generals like they are corrupt and they smell like expen expensive cologne and they have marble floors at home, but he's one of them. He's one of the richest men in Russia. He's one of those, not the richest, but like in top 15. And he's talking like that. So obviously he's lying here, but he's making a case for himself in the eyes of the Russian people. No generals are doing that, only he is. So he knows what's about to come. He needs the people on his side when this power struggle goes active. In this case, he's not a stupid man. He knows what's coming. Russia is losing and he needs the Russian people on his side. <laughs> Everyone with balls got eliminated in the past 10 years. This goes straight against Putin because he eliminates everybody who is not loyal to him. Putin values loyalty over everything, loyalty over skill and intelligence. Everyone in the Russian army is loyal to Putin. It doesn't matter if they're a very good general with skill and experience, they will be fired or changed if they're not loyal. And this is what he's talking about here. He goes against Putin's principles to rule, to hold power. 
He goes against the very foundation of the Russian power structure right now. The, the cards are on the table. Prigozhin has started a next active phase in the Russian power struggle and we're witnessing it right now unfolding. I for one hand need popcorn. And he was part of that system. He was Putin's chef. He did it for 10 to 15 years before he got to be Brigozhin. We know today who is ready to go against Putin. So he's, he's part of the problem. Oh, this is the current problem that needs to be solved by the Russian leadership or the Russian people will solve it by themselves at some point, which is saying that the Russian people have a power to do something. This is the secret deal not official but unofficial deal between Putin's power and the people that they will the people will be apolitical they will not think they will not act if Putin makes their lives better now if Prigozhin brings here the people as a force that can do something on their own this goes straight against that deal that Putin has for 20 years Prigozhin is making a lot of enemies with these videos. We are witnessing him putting a target on his head right now. He is now officially a threat to Putin. Let's see what happens. Now we go to the topic that has already been covered, but I will cover it again because nobody has clear answers. The fact that two Russian choppers and two Russian fire bombers were shot down in Bryansk, 50 kilometers north from the Ukrainian border. It was two MIA choppers and an Su-35 fighter and an Su-34 fighter bomber. These two MIA choppers were radar jammers. They were able to jam over 100 kilometer of radar space. They were there to jam the Ukrainian anti-air capabilities. The Su-34 was carrying uh, Russian glide bombs like JDAMs. They have been bombarding Ukrainian oblasts bordering Russia from within Russia. They don't want to fly over Ukraine, they will be shot down. So they use these glide bombs that can be shot about 15 kilometers away from Ukraine and then they will glide to Ukraine and wreak havoc there. They're like JDAMs because they're Russian, they're not that precise, but they have a huge explosion. Su-34 was carrying such bombs and Su-35 was flying above it to, to perform air defense if Ukrainian fighters would be scrambled. Now they have been doing this almost daily for the last two months, so they have nothing to be afraid of. Ukrainians have not been shooting them down and they're inside of Russia, nothing has been happening. Ukrainians could use two weapon systems that shoot that far. Patriot system? and S-300. Both of them they have. Patriot systems given by the Western Allies is, n is prohibited to shoot into Russia. That is one of the conditions. So S-300s that the Ukraine have, they could be, they're, they're one of the only weapons that could be used to shoot into Russia in such depths. So supposedly they put an S-300 very well camouflaged quite next to the border, very close to it. They didn't use it, they used the radar in passive mode so they, it couldn't be discovered. They let the R Russians fly a few sorties, a few days without doing anything, learning their patterns and now suddenly Russians don't have anything to suspect. They turn on the radar into active mode, they shoot within one minute all of these four missiles. These four missiles hit all of the aircraft from the front position, from the, from the nose side, meaning the shot came from the Ukrainian side. Every aircraft gets hit. The explosions seen on the video are big enough not to be man pads like Igor Kirkin says and the aircraft go down. I think it's a very plausible scenario that Ukrainians used an S-300 next to the border to shoot down these aircraft. We have seen Ukraine using this pattern before. This is not the first time this has been used. Let me know what you think. We don't have clear answers because all of this is speculation. Ukraine officially states that Russians shot them down. The Russians shot down, it's blue on blue. I think the Ukrainians shot them down in a genius maneuver. Put your version in the comments. In this video, you see Zelensky's surprise visit to the United Kingdom and him meeting Rishi Sunak, the UK's prime minister. At the same time, prime minister and the United Kingdom's minister of defense 
pledged to provide Ukraine with combat drones with a range of 200 kilometers. And they pledged to start training Ukrainian pilots with F-16s. This is the official pledge of the UK's Ministry of Defense, the first F-16 official pledge of the Western, Western Allies. The United States, which has to give their permission to export F-16s to Ukraine, has said that at the minimum from the decision to export the real planes would be in Ukraine in one year. It takes a lot of time. And the decision has not even been made yet. And they're already starting to train the pilots. This means the Western Allies are determined to weaponize Ukraine, to train Ukrainian pilots in a very long term. One year plus when this counteroffensive is over, still the Western powers will, will train Ukrainian pilots and plan to give the F-16. Otherwise there would be no point in training the pilots. So this is Putin's worst nightmare that the West will get tired. The UK just showed that they are determined to support at least a few more years. During the same EU trip, Zelensky met the president of France, Macron, and France also pledged to arm Ukraine with their light tanks and additional aid to be sent to Ukraine by France. And in their new tanks, but no, it was just a typo. Unfortunately, a very sad typo. There are howitzers, infantry fighting vehicles, armor personnel carriers, reconnaissance drones and a lot more. G Germany is leveling up their support for Ukraine and gearing up their economy for war. But now my friends let's watch a video from Dmitry because in this video we see one of the very old and legendary Russian weapons that is still actively being used because of lack of weaponry. Uh, can you can you notice anything off with this picture? Look at the weapon. So World War II. This is the Moshin Nagan of the World War II. A very capable weapon. Still nowadays it kills the same way. But it is old. The fact is Russia would not be using these weapons if they would have newer ones. I'm not saying it's a bad weapon or it doesn't kill. I'm just stating that if they use it, what we can read from it is that they're in great lack of modern sniper rifles. But yeah, other than that, this weapon works and shoots and kills the same. This weapon probably served in World War II, fighting against the Nazis, and now it serves in the Russian army again. And of course, we have also seen the Maxim machine guns from World War I still being used on both sides, actually. Of course, it's a minority. It's not like they're using them en masse. During 9th of May parade in Moscow, we saw Lukashenko, the, le the dictator of Belarus, and he was sickly. He looked really sickly and he did not take part in Putin's big dinner. He left before and now he has not been seen since. He has not made a public appearance. The gossip is that he might be poisoned, he might be dying. I don't think he's poisoned by the Russians, if then the Belarusian partisan movement, but not by Putin's government because Putin needs him. He needs a, a stable Belarus by his side because if the Belarus partisan movement could get wind of Lukashenko's death or poisoning, they would be very active. Putin, not, Putin does not want that. We watched somebody who opposes to Prigozhin very strongly. This is Kirkin. Kirkin recently announced that they will go public with their angry patriots club. Kirkin is obviously against Russian Minister of Defense because of their failures and he has a different idea of how this war should be conducted. And now when he decides to go publicly against the Russian Minister of Defense, he puts a huge target on his head. But this again shows us the upcoming power struggle that will happen in Russia. Prigozhin is going big, Kirkin is going big. Let's watch Kirkin's video. Угроза велика. За Пригожином стоят очень серьезные силы. Если верить некоторым моим информаторам, непосредственно за ним стоит Кириенко, глава администрации президента. Some of my informants, I think he has good informants because he has connections. The head of the presidential administration, very, very, extremely high positions in Russia, is directly behind Prigozhin. That means Putin's inner circle also has Prigozhin's side in it. It is not so one-sided after all that Putin holds all the power. Prigozhin wouldn't be so bold if he wouldn't feel that people are behind him and high-ranking people. And this is one of the highest-ranking people, Kiryenko. So this power struggle is about to get real. А за Кириенко стоят братья Ковальчуки, люди, входящие в ближний, в самый ближний круг президента. То есть это тоже интегрированная структура. Это человек, который не просто так, у него вдруг открылись глаза, и он начал говорить правду. Из него делают проект. Кириенко воюет с Шойгу, 
откровенно. То есть поэтому Пригожины атакуют Министерство обороны. Кто-то... Такой Пригожин, скажите мне. Он русский человек? Нет. Но он не русский человек. Он даже по национальности не русский человек. Для него, как и, кстати, для большевик, большинства большевиков образца 2017 года, вы сами должны знать не хуже меня, из кого состояла РСДРПВ, да и М тоже, к 2017 году. Там русских-то было, с гулькин нос. Большинство было евреев с примесью грузин. Сталин yeah, был, He was not Russian, he was Georgian. He had an, a very strong accent throughout his dictatorship. So if, if people think in the West Stalin was Russian, no, he was uh, a, a person who spoke Russian with a very strong accent. For the Russians, it was like hearing a, a very strong foreign accent. That was the dictator. So in, in this one, Kirkin is right. Yeah, there was a lot of nationalities taking part of the revolution. Который на тот момент были очень оппозиционные. Ну, тот же Дзержинский, он же и по женской линии такие евреи. А по отцу, поляк, вообще замечательно. We now know that the power struggle is already in Kremlin. The head of the president's administration is against the president because he's by the by Brigosian. It's going to get real. And in today's Animals are on the Ukrainian side. So we see that this badger went into the Ukrainian trench line trying to attack the Ukrainians, but then he saw he was outnumbered and tried to flee. And then decided to attack again. There are a lot of animals, cats, dogs, badgers sneaking around the trenches because there are food. There is food inside the trenches. So, and I only see the heartwarming videos coming from the Ukrainian side. From the Russian side, we get some other videos that they do with the animals and I don't want to show these videos. So let's have this good feeling from this video. All right, my friends, it's time to butcher some Patreon names. Have you done what I asked? Have you given me some impossible names? Let's see. If you sign up for my Patreon tier 10 or above, I will put your, your name with my own and pronunciation. And if you do it, please make your name as impossible to pronounce as possible. Break my tongue. Martin Israelson. Not difficult. Olex Sidor. Easy. Bernd Mühlböck. Well, that's what I'm talking about, Mr. Mühlböck. I love it, keep it coming. Koznik. Matteo Dobro. These are the new five people. Thank you for supporting the channel. Patreon link is in the description below. If you want news about this Russia-Ukrainian war, the most important news, my Twitter is the best place for it. Links in the description below. Three times a day, you get the most important information happening on the battlefield. Also, I have an Instagram account where I post, for example, gun content, which I cannot publish on YouTube. Link is also in the description below. Until my next video, my friends, Slava Ukraine.